find them. I do have to acknowledge, getting here from Bozeman is not, I mean, as you probably know going back and forth shooting this film, and you certainly know, having just arrived, um, it, is, it is not easy to get to Boston from Bozeman uh, with several flights to get here. So thank you for, for coming all the way here. You're here for less than 24? A lot less. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Jerry, when you were introducing the film, you talked about um, setting out initially to make a film about this project to put mezuzahs on every door. Um, and clearly the film has had become a lot more. I'm, I'm curious what surprised you and what, um, and what you learned in the process of making the film that brought you here. Um, what, did, what surprised you about both um, Rabbi Chaim, but also about the Jews of Montana? Well, I think we were just like everybody else, surprised that yes, there are, there are lots of Jews, and it turns out not only is there are the Orthodox Jews, but there, are, of course, are Reformed Jews, and there, are, of course, conservative Jews. And like everybody else, Jews are wonderful people. We love them all, but we all, you know, there's a lot of bickering, of course. <laughs> and uh, we certainly, we certainly saw it here in, in all its forms. And uh, and you know, I think it's a wonderful thing about Judaism. But but with that, I, I mean, I don't know any movie. If I can brag for one second about our film, that debate between the two rabbis. Isn't, I don't know any film ever that has done that, and you just see two positions so beautifully laid out that are so di diametrically opposed and yet have great logic to them. And I think that's our object in our movie, was to have everybody give their best shot, their best arguments, and finally, and it's not that we're evasive and say we don't have any positions with someone, we have many positions, but we really believe it's great for audiences to unravel and figure out how they feel about Chabad, and that's what our movie was. Can I add to that too? Um, so I, what surprised me about the Montana Jewish community is how many different ways there are to be Jewish in a place as remote as Montana, um, in a state with one million people, and would you say less than 2,000 Jews? Is that a little more? Well, there are more than 2,000. He knows, he knows right there. Um, but 2,100. 2,100. <laughs> 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 Um, actually, what's been interesting is in making this movie, people have contacted us saying we're considering, we're Jews considering moving to Montana. We want to see the movie to figure out if, <laughs> if we should do it. Yeah, we have Give them a high um, But what, what really surprised us was just how many different ways there are to be Jewish and, and that people kind of feel very comfortable going between Chabad and also at synagogue, the more progressive synagogue, and that there's sort of no, like the community, there, there may be bickering among the rabbis, but the community itself, kind of, there's a continuum of being Jewish and all different ways to do that. And I, I, that was like a, a lovely thing to discover. It's something maybe we, we all need to learn from, I think. I want to ask you too, I mean, you arrived in Montana from, from Brooklyn, you know, from a place where there was a very vivid Jewish life that you just had to walk out the door to see. Um, in the film, you allude to the fact that you originally landed there with a friend and then ended up saying, can you talk a little bit about what surprised you and sort of how you ultimately ended up staying there? So I, I came in 2004 with a fellow yeshiva student in Chabad in the summers. They send the peers of rabbinical students to places that don't have permanent traditional Jewish communities. And so I crashed into Montana in, in August of 2004 and we flew into Billings and we started all the way in Mile City in eastern Montana and spent a month traversing all the way up to northwest Montana and Eureka. We're talking about 17 hours worth of driving in, in, in state, just going throughout Montana. And what it, it didn't surprise me, because I had done this my whole life growing up, even in New York, but it was an incredible thing to knock on doors uh, in Big Sky Country, you know, in the gorgeous summer months. I mean, talk about August in Montana, that is the place to be. And the re how we received, I mean, again, 90, whatever the percent was of Jews in Montana were unaffiliated. Right? There's a lot of, you, you spoke about the bickering on the film, the part that isn't emphasized enough on the film is that with all the congregations, including Chabad, the vast majority of Jews in Montana are not affiliated with any synagogue. And the vast majority of people coming to Chabad are from unaffiliated backgrounds. They, they're coming from zero into the Chabad house. And so what we found is that incredible receptiveness and that we believe that's embedded in the Jewish soul. That is not about, it's not about, the, what do they call it over there in the film, the roster, we have a roster, a Chabad soul roster, you know, I was, I heard, I heard the, uh, this Shabbos here at the Harvard Law School, we have with us tonight uh, an incredible attorney, Nat Lewin from Washington, D.C., 
um, who entertained and spoke with 300 Harvard Law School students. You think that's from some roster we have going? I doubt the rabbis even know the names of all the 300 students. It was an opportunity for Jews to experience Shabbos in an incredible environment. And that's what I found in the 14 years since I stepped foot into Montana, is that type of um, welcome that we've received. And so it's a, it's a mutual relationship of true appreciation for what each of us bring to the table. You speak about that welcome, and I'm curious sort of how, I mean, you clearly quickly bonded as filmmakers and I bonded mostly with David. Where's the, where's the video guy? That's true, actually. Yeah. He's in love with it. He's in I love put with up with these two Jews because of David. <laughs> with, our, with our Goisha cinematographer. That's who he likes. Trust me. It wasn't with David. I would have thrown them out a long time ago. I'm curious if you were as welcomed by the other, by the other um, communities, Jewish communities in Montana. Well, I could say even, I think even with Haim, we're joking, but it's not correctly Every uh, Jewish community was suspicious of us because, you know, when you make a documentary, you can sell out anybody, you can cut the film any way you want, and nobody could quite know, you know, what what do we represent? And understandably, and partly, we didn't know what we represent. We didn't represent anything except, I guess, Jewish curiosity making the film. So every so, I that's all I can say is that people did they they let us film. But nobody was really thrilled about being filmed by I will say that one of the greatest moments of the film is actually not on the film. And that is, it was, the whole film was worth it just for the fact that this Jew from Cambridge, at the age of, let's say he was 50, I don't want to you know, give away your age, um, <laughs> put on to film for the first time in his life in the Shul of Bozeman. And for me, all the schlepping and the nudnik of videoing me for hundreds of hours was worth it just for him to do an incredible mitzvah for the first time in his life. He's lucky that he was already circumcised much younger because I would have done that in the show as well. You really didn't know what you were in for. <laughs> so, so I want to go back to that, that scene where you meet with Rabbi Ed. Um, was it, was it, I guess this is a question for all of you, was it hard to get the two of you in the room together and had you thought about it before the film? Um, I think it was not, not something they would normally would do, and so the both were, again, skeptical of whether it would work and what, what would be talked about. I and mean, it's just, you know, you really just have a lot of power as the filmmakers. So, so I, I say, I am not saying anything against anybody who is suspicious of it. They're, they're correct. I, I will say that, I mean, Ed and I meet all the time. I mean, three weeks ago, he was in my house for an hour and a half. He's actually running for political office now, so he was trying to get my, a, a donation from me. Um, I'm not joking. Um, I told him I don't give any political money. You're kidding, rabbis giving money to politicians. That's a dangerous place. But the point is that we've always, got, we always had a relationship. I think the, 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 the part that we were worried about is you're putting us in a room knowing that we don't agree on almost anything religiously. We, we agree about Paul Yisrael. We, we, we agree that we need to fight for the survival of the Jewish people. We do. And we've had that relationship from the day Ed moved to Bozeman. But you want us to debate on stuff that we know there's no solution to. So I knew it was just about film. So nevertheless, somehow they managed to trigger my passion even in that. And because I can't help myself. When a guy is sitting across from me, as much as I can respect him as a human being, and he's talking about Israel the way he did it. So I, it triggered in me my natural response to it. Did it shift your relationship in the long term? Good or bad? No, I mean, we, I, like I said, we had a, we had, we had a, we had a very uh, amicable relationship before. Um, I think, actually, Ed wanted to know what I thought about the film. Um, I told him I loved it. I thought he did great um, for Chabad. Yeah. He did great for Chabad on the film. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I wanted him to talk even longer. But, but, but I do think that, again, the film, they were looking. They were looking to try it. Jerry and Andy will admit they like that action. They want to make it look like the Jewish community has friction. The reality is, like you said yourself, Jerry, most of the Jews in Montana don't see themselves as affiliated with one particular synagogue. They'll come to a Hanukkah party at Chabad, the next night they'll go to a Hanukkah party at Beth Shalom, and they don't see it as a contradiction, and maybe they shouldn't. Why should they? I'm not making a Hanukkah party every night. I make only six nights of Hanukkah party. There's two nights available for Beth Shalom. They should go there. <laughs> Because it's, you know, I, I think you started making this film a few years ago. This is a time when we're talking a lot about, you know, we're sitting here in Somerville and Cambridge and we're talking a lot about the rest of America. Um, and your last film was in was shot in Maine and, and here in, in the Boston area. Um, yours was a historical film. So what, what was, 
what was the process for you of deciding to make a film that, that looked at the broader view of America and, and within that a Jewish, a Jewish perspective? Um, how, how did the timing of, of making a film about Montana work for you? Yeah, so the inspiration was definitely Jerry because originally it was going to be a, the Mezuzah movie, but then once we knew Haim, we you know we were on that journey. Um, but I think that we felt that you know it's a very political time, and we wanted to sort of push ourselves as filmmakers to connect with somebody or ask ourselves, can we connect with somebody who's very religiously different than us in a place that we had never been, um, and had a lot of misconceptions about. I mean, I don't know. If, what this audience was in terms of feeling, you know, your, your misconceptions about Montana, but like the gun scene, you know, was this huge deal for us as, you know, people from Boston. And it was, it was very like um, charged and it's not that way in Montana. You know, it's part of their life. It's part of their culture. As Haim says, there is a respect for guns. There's actually a holiday. Um, I forget what, what it is, but it's like a-, a Every day. Every day. <laughs> It's like a, in the fall sometime where kids get out of school to go hunting with their parents. Um, so this is just... Democrats have guns. Democrats, Democrats have guns. Have guns. Everyone. 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 No, it's do. not It's not strange. But for us, it was, it was a real like eye-opener. So, I mean, part of our mission was really to, to see if we could connect with somebody. And um, we don't agree. We still don't agree on everything. <laughs> we probably, the, probably never will. But I can say, you know, we are friends with Hayam. We like Hayam's family. We like spending time with Hayam. And um, that was a wonderful <laughs> thing that came out of the making of this film. And I think that was one of the points that Brian Schnitzer on the film made. He says, you know, people talk about Chabad with all these fancy terms. We're a cult. We're missionaries. I mean, I have such incredible titles you guys gave me on this film. Um, but he said that most of the people you hear this from are people that never interacted with Chabad. And I always say, if you're so open-minded, if you're so liberal, right, we're in the center of liberalism right here in Massachusetts, why are you so scared to hang out and have a cup of coffee with a Chabad rabbi? Am I that scary? Seriously. So my point is that, you know, Amy, Jerry, they're friends now, and they're not the only ones. There's hundreds of Jews in Montana who may attend or not attend synagogue on a regular basis, but they consider uh, our family to be dear friends of theirs, and that's because we have an open home, truly, Come as you wish, when you want, and celebrate your Judaism, or just be our friend. They don't only come to us for Jewish things. They come to us when they're having a family issue, because we're just their dear friends. And that's really what the Rebbe's vision was, not to create religious uh, synagogues. It was to create a Jewish family around the world. Before, I, I want to sort of reflect on that and, and I open it to audience questions in a moment. I'm curious, um, because you do live a, a religious life, and you have people come into your home who lead, lead very different Jewish lives. And your kids go to school in public schools, it looks like. Um, and I, I'm sure that's something that Chabad lives around the world deal with. They, their kids don't have a... I think that we see Jewish communities living close to each other because it preserves their Jewishness. How do you, how do you think about that sort of being out in Montana where most people look, look very different from you? and live Jewish lives that are very different from so you. First, first they want to correct something. Most Chabad rabbis do not send their kids to public school. Um, we had a situation with one of our children has special needs, our ZC, and so we made a, a family decision of what was right for her with the guidance of senior rabbis. Um, and I'm comfortable with the decision, but I just don't want you to think it's universal. But I think there's a bigger question, is how are you raising an Orthodox Jewish child in a place like Bozeman, where Halloween and Christmas are the most exciting parts, and, uh, you know, exciting holidays in town, and having them maintain their Jewish identity and be comfortable with it and be proud of it. And I think that in today's day and age, they actually have a healthier identity than when you shove them into a school with 900 other Jewish kids. So my kids have to ask questions. There's nothing taken for granted. I remember when Chaya was in first grade, she said to me on the way home from school, and she said, Abba, why don't we do Christmas? First of all, I want to take an opportunity here. My father and his wife, Leah, drove from New York to be here tonight with us. So I was about to mention something about my father. So. Um, now, that being said, if I would have asked my father when I was in first grade, why don't we do Christmas, I'm not sure what the fingerprints would look like on my cheek, but it would not look very pretty. But yet, when a kid's growing up in Bozeman, Montana, you can't ignore that question. That's, in a, that's a, it's a deep question. So I spent about 90 seconds explaining to her what Islam is, and she, had, she never met a Muslim, she lives in Montana, so I explained to her what Muslims believe, and I explained to her what Christians believe, and she said, now she got it, it took 90 seconds, she understood why we can't believe in anything that doesn't represent one God. And that was the end of it. 
So now, I don't have to worry about when she's 15, she's going to discover that there's Santa Claus, she'll discover that there's a Christmas tree. She knows it all, she sees it all. She doesn't, she, we don't hide it from them. When there's questions, we, we do our best to answer them. And I think that integration, right? Integration with our assimilation. And that is a possibility, but you have to have an extremely strong Jewish identity in the home. And if you have it in your home, you can handle almost anything. I'd love to open it to audience questions. Yeah, we'd love to actually we'd love to have a controversial series. <laughs> the comment was there's a controversial yeah. question. I'll repeat that. Actually, Uncle Bud joining in a lot of discussions, maybe 5,000 to 100. But the one thing he will not tolerate is any discussion of homosexuality, the gay Jewish soul, the transsexual Jewish soul. And I actually got cut off as soon as I tried to have any discussion about you, you, so, so the question, the question is, to, um, Chaim, about um, about how Chabad deals with homosexuality, um, and that's a good question. Uh, first of all, my Shabbos table, you will never cut off of anything. We have discussions on any topic under the sun, and if you come to Bozeman, I'll be happy to continue it there. But I will say that we don't run away from conversations. There's no question. Certain things are uncomfortable because you want to share an opinion that's based on the Torah, but you also are sensitive to the fact that. People have their own journeys, and you don't want to chase them away, and you want to make them feel at home. So what I say always, I say this to people all the time, you're welcome to come to shul, you're welcome to attend, you're welcome to be part of everything. You want me to condone a particular behavior, depends how you're asking me to condone it, as a rabbi, as Chaim Brook. As Chaim Brook, I love every human being, and I treat every human being with dignity and respect, no matter what their orientation is or their choices in their life. But if you're asking me as a rabbi to give you the Torah's guidance, what would you like me to do? I mean, I have to open up the book. If you're asking me what the Torah says, I can't make it up. I've got to open the book and share it with you. So there's a, it, it's a complicated issue, but for me it really isn't because as a human being, the treating of every human being with dignity without judgmentalism, right? I don't want to be judged for being heterosexual, and I don't think people should be judged for being any type of orientation. But... If you're asking me a halacha question, as a rabbi, as a, as a student of Torah, I mean, how, how could I get away with that without saying the truth? I mean, the reason people come to Chabad is because they know, like Paolo said on the video, they get an authentic answer that's straight from the book. What they do with that answer is up to them. But we definitely don't run away from conversations, so I apologize. I don't know, you know, again, I wasn't at the conversation. You said 5,000 conversations. I wasn't there. Hundred percent, and I agree on love. Not this commentary, but it's really the case that this is a subject maybe of a lot of rabbis would not feel so. But I want to go into this much further. We actually have some outtakes, so maybe we didn't have room for the movie. About we actually asked this question. We could not figure out how to put it into the movie, and it was sort of. Kaim said the same, but he also, I think, importantly said that if someone is gay or lesbian. And once they come to your city, they do. They are well. They do. Not only they're welcome. They they're, do. They do, and they're welcome. And and, and the they're ones welcome. that come, they're not looking for me to tell them what the Torah is. They're looking to know that they have a place at my Shabbos table, and they always do. And they always will, and that's what the Rebbe envisioned for the world. If they come to me for religious stuff, that's another thing, and I deal with it accordingly, like every other human being. Right here. Were the other rabbis invited? Yes. Yeah. Two. 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 Oh, were the other rabbis invited to I'm not in charge of that. I have no idea. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I, I can speak to that because we, we invited the guests. Um, and we in, the film focused on Rabbi Chaim. We, we don't have, I mean, it turns out it's more expensive to bring someone in from Bozeman <laughs> than from Europe. So <laughs> we brought Rabbi Chaim. We hope at some point, maybe in Montana, we will have a day with all the rabbis on the stage. I'm going to be in Boston that day. <laughs> I don't think so. Right there. Also, I, I will just say that other rabbis have seen the film, and you know, I think what we what we've experienced, and probably maybe I don't know if Chaim, you would agree with this or not, but like of course everybody wants the film to be on some level about them. So I think that they, you know, have embraced the film, and and you know, seemingly will be on stage with us in Montana, um, but. Um, yeah, we can't afford, unfortunately, to bring everybody here. So first of all, it was a beautiful place. One of our sons lived there for five or six months. And one of our questions always to him was, are you going to go to Shabbat services? He did go, I think, to Seder once, but I think it's a strong So the comment was that their son had lived. I'm going to just 
summarize it for people who can't hear, that their son had lived in Bozeman and it's beautiful. And, So the question was whether your daughter Shoshana was Jewish when you adopted her. She came from a Jewish family. I mean, I, it's beyond the scope of this evening to go into her whole story. But just to give you a little bit, on the video, on the, on the film, it says that she's at a Chabad boarding school in Florida. But after a couple months in the Chabad boarding school in Florida, we realized that because of her childhood trauma, she needed more than a typical Chabad boarding school. And she's today in a equine therapy, a horse therapy school in Virgin, Utah, near Zion National Park. She's been there now for about eight months, and she's getting, making incredible progress in her journey. We'll actually be there this coming Shabbos in Utah. Um, and so her story is very, very unique, very different. It's not something I would have ever signed up for unless God literally put her at our front door, and then we just had to answer the call, and I'm glad we made the right call. So she, she has a very different story, and all of our children have some kind of Jewish connection. The details of each of them, whether they had to undergo a conversion or not to Judaism, that's beyond the scope. Come to have coffee with me in Bozeman, and we'll chat about it. And I understand that you know you, you didn't want to include your children as much. You know you don't want didn't want to go into it in the film. But can you talk a little bit about sort of how you worked around um, putting Rabbi Chaim's children in the film, and and how much you've included his family versus the world around his family? Well, I think one ten, one the first time we went there, um, we wanted obviously as much of everything. And Chaim took me aside one day and said, Jerry, we are real, you are really, we, I'm really trusting you in this film. I'm really trusting that you're going to be okay with that. Was, Ooh, you're right. Because this is so sensitive, dealing with families. So we, our, our philosophy is, you know, one, we celebrate. One of the reasons we like Chaim, we obviously have com, com, lots of political, theological differences. He's a great father. He really is a wonderful father. Uh, and so... We respected any boundary that he set up with us talking to his, his kids first and then his wife second. So we really did most of the talking the first time and after that every, they, we were mostly shut out from talking to his family and that was okay with us. We respected because time wants the privacy of his family more than the glory of this movie. So. Can you talk about the different, there are some, there are some Orthodox or Haredi groups that are opposed to the state of Israel and others that are not. Can you talk about Sure. That? I mean, the, the, let's start from the basis. I mean, we're studying now the book of Genesis and we're reading about God giving the land of Israel to Abraham and Sarah and to their descendants through Isaac. And so the love and, and adoration and connection, inherent connection that each of us has to the land of Israel is something that every Jew has a connection to. As far as the modern state of Israel, it's complicated. My grandfather, my father's father, fought in, in, in the Israeli Defense Force in 1948, in 1967, in 1973, actually in 1981, in 1982, and then in 1991 during the Gulf War, he was like 70 something years old, he was still trying to go back into the reserves and they told him to go home. So we, we serve in the army, we love the land, do we, do we love the fact that there was ultra secular people like Theodor Herzl who um, didn't believe necessarily in God or religion, and they were the sort of the founders of the modern state of Israel? No, it's not, a, it's not a good thing, because a lot of the philosophy about the modern state of Israel is based on secularism and atheism and not in God, which causes a lot of problems. When I go to an APAC event in D.C. and I hear people talking about 60 years of Israel, 70 years of Israel, I'm like, guys, who gave you a calculator? We're like 4,000, you're like 3,900 years behind. And so... Yes to the love to the land of Israel. Yes to supporting Israel in its current state because there's millions and millions of Jewish lives at stake in our Holy Land. But exactly how we relate to modern Zionism, I think Zionism speaks for itself. Let me know when you run into one of Theodor Herzl's Jewish grandchildren living in Tel Aviv, and we'll talk about it then. I, I think it's also, um, just to, to expand on that, there are, there are, there are some groups there are some Hasidic groups that are oh, yeah, uh, yeah. that are that are anti-Zionist anti because because of a lot of what you were just talking about that there, there shouldn't be a there shouldn't be a modern 
and not religious. Right, and they don't, they, they, they have the inability of having the nuanced approach of knowing how you can love the land, love the, support the army. In our shul in Bozeman, every Friday night, we pray for the Israeli soldiers and the American soldiers, but the, we, we, you know, have that nuanced approach. Yes, I love the land. Yes, I support the survival of our people in the land. But I don't have to agree with the philosophy necessarily that created the modern state, which was going to be in Uganda and ended up in Israel. So I, th I think that there's that there's a, an array of opinions within within the, 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 there's a, there's a lot of and it comes of many things within the Hasidic and ultra orthodox um, communities. There are many differences in opinion, e even within Chabad. I'm sure. Yes, right here. Yeah. What are the edu how do you become a Chabad rabbi? You have to drink a lot of whiskey and eat a lot of sushi. Isn't that clear in the film? <laughs> um, we, we, we become, well, to be a rabbi, you need to study the basics. It takes about a year to get your actual rabbinical ordination. But to do what we do is a lifetime of learning. This is not something anyone can train you. There's no school that says, okay, we're going to go now and someone's going to teach me how to do outreach in Montana. You have to learn how, you have to use your own unique gifts, your own unique talents, your own personality, and recognize, is this place a match for me and what I want to do for Jewish life in the future? And then go out there and use every faculty you have to make a difference in the world. So there's no training program. Sure, you get advice from senior rabbis, but it's about you doing the best you can to change the world. And the rabbi had no criteria. If you can do the job, go out there and do it. With it, with it I can see there are so many questions about Chabad, and I think you... Well, we were asking a lot of these questions when you started making the film. How much, um, how did you decide sort of to balance between being in Bozeman and you go to Chabad headquarters in Crown Heights in Brooklyn? How much were you going to do, how did you decide how much of the background of Chabad to put in versus the actual story of Rabbi Chaim? That was, that was a challenge, um, partly because we, like Jerry said at the beginning, you know, ultimately what we wanted to do was to take people on the journey that we took, um, which was, you know, very, we knew very little about Chabad at the beginning of this process. And what we discovered is that we sort of internalized a lot as we went, as filmmakers often do. And so part of having great editors is having them sort of push you to, no, no, you, you've got to explain that more. We've got to get more information out there about that kind of stuff. Um, and the other interesting part, which I've never done before as a filmmaker, and I'm absolutely committed to doing from here on out, is we would show the, the cuts to people, like rough cuts, along the way. Um, you know, trusted group of, of um, film advisors, I guess you'd call them. And, and they were asking us questions that they didn't understand through the making of, of the process of making the film. And then we would go back to Montana and shoot more with those questions in mind. Um, so that was a big part of the process, and I, and I think, I mean, initially we thought this would be a short film. This is how little we knew. Uh, we, Jerry had talked to Haim, this guy's on a mission to get a mezuzah in the home of every Jew in the state of Montana. What a fun story, that sounds great, let's go shoot it, it's beautiful, it's Montana. You know, it's a place we hadn't been, we were inspired by this sort of need to connect with somebody who was very politically and religiously different than us, and then, we met Haim, lo and behold, there's another synagogue in town. Wow, and there's some, some tension there. Um, so then that became part of the film, and you know things kind of kept developing, which can happen in documentary film. That's the beauty of making a documentary that unfolds over time. You don't always know at the beginning what it's gonna be at the end. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so that was very much our process. I think we also uncovered you know, some myths about Chabad, um, as again, we are very secular. We are not Chabad in any, in not yet. any way. Not yet. Never, never, <laughs> once never. You once you never. join my cult. <laughs> never. As I always tell Chaim, I don't want the Messiah to come. He wants He's coming to anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so. But, but, like, but so we, so we talk to our good lefty friends. We hear their assertions about Chabad. And we're like, hmm, is that true or not? So just two quick ones that I think we maybe, you know, that we, you know, covered in the movie is people's belief that, well, Chabad is this unbelievably rich organization in New York, and this is piling money on every Chabad, and we found out, no, that's not true at all. As we see here, they give you seed money, and then every Chabad is on its own. You know, say if you've been to Chabad headquarters in New York, it looks like a, a, a broken down junior high school from 50 years ago. So this is, this is where, 
you know, this is where the money comes from. The other, you know, thing we all hear all the time is those mitzvah mobiles. My God, you walk into one of those, you know, are you Jewish? Are you, you walk in and they're going to convert you to a Chabad in one second and you got to, you know, watch out, watch out. You become part of the cult. And we've learned, and I think this is absolutely true, that it's not the object at all. The object is to get you to do a mitzvah. That's the object. Chaim has had, he can tell you, in his years in Bozeman, um, if he's there to try to make everybody Chabad, he's an absolute failure. You're a failure. Because how many people have become Chabad? A handful of people, maybe. Like, wasn't there one person who's now got the, got one guy. One guy. One guy. So that's not what, and he was 19. <laughs> but you hear this from everybody. That's what Chabad is after, is to make you into Chabad. They have different things. I think it's pretty weird that they're trying to get you, you know, to, to, to Messiah to come. That's me. But it, but at least factually, that is what it's Which about. Which is different. I think the Messiah will be someone that will rule Israel. And you think Obama was the Messiah. That's the only difference. Obama's okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. We have time for just two more questions. In the back of the red. Heaven. <laughs> Just a technical question. <laughs> First, firstly, um, I stopped worrying. After I went to Disney World, I stopped worrying about myself going to hell. I figured it can't be any worse than going to Disney World. Um, but listen, I'm not in charge of heaven and hell. You think I, I don't know? I don't. Know, I go to heaven. Do you know the answer? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't. I, I don't delve into that. Nor do I think it's important. It's not a, to me, observing Shabbos or not observing Shabbos or uh, shaking a little of an esrog on Sukkot or not is not about heaven and hell. If that's, if unfortunately, that's what people were taught in the 50s and 60s, which is why they ran away from Judaism. It's not about that. It's about having a moment with God. And if you're having a moment with God, it's not relevant about heaven and hell in this part of it. It's, a, it's relevant about having an incredible moment with the creator of heaven and earth. So heaven and hell, we'll figure it out. Either we'll meet each other or we won't. If you meet me, you'll know you're in, uh, I won't. <laughs> No, I don't think it's any part of no, Steve so the Bullock. Question, the question was about yeah. the female rabbi and how she dealt with the attention that was given to the male rabbis by the, the by the politicians in the film and right. what your conversations were. No, like were. that. Well, that's Steve Bullock, who was you know one of the guys running for president, is a really good guy. No, he had he had private meetings with Francine Rostin and the other people, which weren't even publicized. There's never been a newspaper article. He just went to their house. He, Went to Whitefish to console them about what was happening. Yeah, so that, so they were, so those are just two different. They're just two different meetings. That's all. I, I mean, I, the question, I guess, can I, can I also put it to you, Amy, as, as the woman on stage, how how you felt as a as a female filmmaker, um, being there and sort of dealing with a woman rabbi who's um, clearly, you know, you, I'm assuming not acknowledged as a rabbi. Why not? All but, the time. That was another myth of the film. What do you mean acknowledge? I call her Rabbi Rostin all the time. So what is the... I acknowledge her by the title she asks me to acknowledge her by. So what part of it... You know, it goes to her sexism point. In other words, it's not, it's not about her being a woman. I treat her like I treat Ed Staffman or Alan Setcher. In other words, it's a bigger debate. Yeah, no, well, right. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, we're, 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 <laughs> Amy will answer. I mean, well. yeah. so in terms of, for me, everybody who's in that film is a rabbi, and I respect. Um, so in terms of that question, that's absolutely my feeling. In terms of my own uh, feeling as a woman, and you know, 
do I have issues with Hasidism and how they, they treat women? Yes, in some cases. Do I have issues with Hayim? No, I accept certain things about him and I, and I think you accept certain things about me. If I wanted to be a rabbi. I didn't ask that question. It was really about the political representation. Oh. Oh, well, I think it goes to Jerry's point, which is that those meetings did happen. In other words, Francine did meet with the governor, but those were closed door meetings that we weren't privy to as filmmakers. Um, and so out of respect for her and her choices, that isn't on, on screen. So does that make sense? Okay, okay. Okay, um, well, I wanna ask you both where the film is going next. Um, and where people can go. Yeah, so actually this coming weekend, um, the weekend after this, we're going to be in Birmingham, Alabama in a new festival called the Sidewalk Jewish Film Festival, which we're really excited about. And the film will be, um, it just screened at Doc NYC in New York last weekend, but we'll be having our second screening on December 17th, which is a Tuesday night at the JCC Manhattan. So we urge you to tell all your friends in New York to please come to that screening. It's gonna be fantastic. Jerry and I will be there. Fortunately, Haim is not available for that. Um, and we will be screening at film festivals in um, Atlanta, and Palm Beach, uh, Miami, what? Austin. Austin. Oh yeah, yeah. Austin. 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 Um, <laughs> where else? But if you, Orange like, County. But if you know places in the Boston area that might show the film, please talk to us about any kind of venue we're interested in. Obviously, spreading it out and showing it. And yeah, synagogues, JCCs, um, community centers, any place that you guys know that you'd you'd like to have this film and have this conversation, um, which we think is an important one to have. Please let us know. Has it shown in Bozeman yet? No. It has not shown the well, we're Everyone at Bozeman wants to know when it's coming to Bozeman. No one has an that. answer. We can't do it in the winter because you can't get around there. In the, I mean, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, but it's just hard to fly in and out. Uh, so we're looking to do like a spring, uh, summer uh, screening series, actually, in, in Montana. Well, we look forward to hearing how that goes. And thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone who's made this 31st.